Hello watch lovers, welcome back to the channel. My name is Stian and today we have a very rare Omega on the bench. It's an Omega Ranchero from 1958. You see the watch has uh, seen better days, the dial has uh, degraded somewhat, but it's still in pretty nice shape. And we see the movement is loose inside the case. There are a couple of reasons for that. Also looks like uh, that broad arrow uh, hour hand, the loom, has been uh, redone, it seems. Because this uh, watch has radium, so it's uh, a bit radioactive. This watch uh, belongs to uh, Francesco. And uh, he uh, wants to keep the watch original as far as possible. So the only thing we're going to actually uh, change on the watch is the loom in the hands. The watch runs pretty well actually, it's a bit low amplitude, but uh, the timekeeping is pretty extraordinary for a watch that hasn't been serviced for uh, decades. Let's open this baby up and see what we find inside. And we find the Omega 267 and a lot of dirt. Pretty amazing that this watch keeps that good time with this uh, jungle inside it. But that is testament to the quality of uh, this watch. As mentioned, uh, this watch is from 1958 and the loom on the dial and the hands were uh, radium, which is uh, radioactive and uh, obviously not healthy. So to make sure that uh, I don't inhale any of those uh, fragments, pieces, and also the radon gas under the crystal, I use this uh, ventilation system, which is very noisy, so I turned off all the noise there. But with the movement out of the case, we see that the dial is in a really nice condition. And this is probably where a lot of people would say, hey, we need to clean the dial. And that is not really possible. Dials are extremely fragile. And uh, the second you start touching them, especially a dial like this, you're going to start destroying it. So we're not going to do that. What we are going to do is uh, talk about the history of this watch, because it's, it is a really peculiar one. So in 1957, Omega released three watches that are uh, quite uh, legendary by themselves. The uh, Omega Speedmaster, of course the Seamaster 300, so a professional version of the Seamaster, and then also the Railmaster, which has a very strong protection against magnetism. These uh, three watches all shared uh, some uh, common design features. They had the broad arrow on uh, the hour hand. They came with dark dials. They also came with lighter dials, but initially dark dials. And uh, they were quite similar looking. So uh, they were also termed uh, the Three Musketeers. Now, those of you who have read the Three Musketeers or seen one of the many uh, movie versions know that, uh, yes, there are Three Musketeers, but uh, the actual uh, main character of uh, both the movies and uh, the novel is a fourth guy, D'Artagnan. So the year after introducing the Speedmaster, Seamaster 300 and Railmaster, Omega decided to uh, profit on the massive success of those watches with an entry-level watch using the exact same design language. And that's the watch we're working on here, the Omega Ranchero. Hand-wound movement, but a very uh, similar design to those other three. So this one is then sometimes called the fourth Musketeer for that very reason. Now, interestingly, if you go to uh, the Omega website nowadays, you will find a reissue of those three watches, all termed the 1957 Heritage. What you will not find is a reissue of the Ranchero. So what happened to D'Artagnan? Well, ultimately he got married, became the captain of the Muscadet. Uh, sorry, uh, what happened to the Ranchero? What happened is that it was a massive flop was uh, easily Omega's biggest flop. It was only produced for two years before being shelved. 
And the reason for it flopping is uh, generally attributed to the name Ranchero, which means uh, something like uh, farmhand, uh, farm worker in uh, Spanish. And that um, apparently didn't really go down well in uh, Spanish speaking markets, which are big and many. So uh, overall, uh, Omega found that this was not really worth pursuing. So uh, yeah, the entry level watch that was intended to be cheap is actually very expensive nowadays because it is a collector's item. So Francesco uh, thought that this watch wasn't really worth much. He just asked if I could uh, have a look at it. But this watch is worth uh, quite a few thousand, actually. Not too bad for a simple uh, farmhand. And just a small footnote as we uh, finish the disassembly. The Ranchero name was actually reused for a brief while, a year or so, in limited markets in the 70s. But the watch looked very different, and uh, that one also flopped, so <laughs> double uh, flop for the Ranchero. We're going to take out uh, the shock settings. This watch uh, does uh, have uh, Inca block uh, shock settings. And uh, as I've been talking, you've been seeing a few uh, close-ups as well of uh, all the dirt. It's a lot of dirt in this uh, movement. It's been ages since it's been uh, serviced. But it has been serviced at uh, some point. One of the things that uh, seemed to have happened in that service is that they changed the crown and also removed the crown tube which are both uh, not good for an original watch. And that is a bit of an issue, especially the crown, the crown tube. We can always uh, make one or find one. But the crown, this watch had a pretty special crown. And given that the watch was only produced for two years in 58 and 59, finding uh, an original crown is really difficult. So uh, we're going to leave the current crown on until we can find the proper crown. And then I will uh, update you guys on that. We're cleaning out the jewel holes and doing some pre-cleaning. There are some other dirty parts as well that we have to pre-clean before putting them in the washing machine or the cleaning machine rather. The mainspring is uh, of the new type does not mean it's new, but it has uh, at least uh, been replaced since the 1960s. So we're of course going to run all the movement parts uh, through our cleaning machine. But uh, before doing so, uh, we're going to pre-clean uh, some of the dirtiest parts in uh, some Swiss play dough, also called Rodico. That is uh, cheaper than uh, having to uh, change all the cleaning liquids, which are quite expensive. Especially this uh, center wheel that we're doing here was very, very uh, dirty. Now, one question uh, a lot of people uh, ask uh, is uh, how can watches become dirty or have hair and stuff inside them? I mean, it literally said waterproof at the back of the case, right? So if it's waterproof, then it should also be uh, dirt proof, uh, logic would tell us. The thing is that uh, no cases are completely waterproof. So nowadays they don't uh, use waterproof anymore either. They say uh, water resistant to a certain uh, level, certain degree. And the reason for that is that we need to be able to operate the watch. And that's basically then uh, the crown. So due to the hole for the crown and the stem, uh, there will be uh, a way for dirt and uh, debris to enter the watch. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Let's now get uh, the movement parts into the cleaning machine.
All right, let's turn our attention to the case. As I mentioned, uh, Francesco does not want to uh, have the case restored in any way, which I completely agree with. The case is in very fine condition. The watch uh, belonged to his father, and uh, he didn't wear it that much, uh, apparently. So uh, we're going to clean it, of course, get some uh, gunk and DNA out of there. And there is quite some to get out. Not as bad as a few other watches we've done on this channel, but uh, still. Good for the compost for my wife. The case was constructed to be uh, quite uh, water resistant. This uh, gasket here is a big uh, reason for that. Assuming uh, the watch case is intact, there are three entry points basically for, uh, for water, for dirt, that kind of uh, thing. The main of those three is uh, the crown simply because you drill a hole in the case to uh, be able to uh, put the stem and the crown in there. The other two are uh, then through the crystal, the gasket there, and through the case back. Of course, some watches don't have a case back, and there are actually watches that are a radio set, so you don't have to ever open the case, and then you can actually make them waterproof, but uh, that's a bit of an exception. Now let's get the case into uh, the ultrasonic and we can continue discussing a little bit about uh, water resistance. This sound goes out to all those lovers of the nail scratching against the blackboard. Brace yourselves. I discussed in uh, another video uh, about radioactivity and uh, the levels we can expect in uh, old watches with the radium uh, loom. I will link to that video in the description. So this watch is uh, radioactive. It is not a watch you want to uh, carry to bed next to your open mouth with a crack in the crystal. But for general use, uh, the watch is of course fine. You don't want to wear it absolutely every day. But uh, there is uh, always radiation around us. And wearing a watch with the radium uh, occasionally it's uh, perfectly fine. We're not going to replace the radium on the dial. That is a little bit too invasive and will uh, probably change the appearance of the watch a little bit more than we like. It seems the loom in the hour hand was replaced because it's uh, very different looking from uh, the minute hand. You can see that I'm uh, removing this old loom in the water. That's a tip I actually got from uh, one of the viewers of that uh, other video. So thanks for that. It's a good tip. That way uh, the radium will be uh, captured in the water. So it's not going to be flying around in the dust particles in my workshop. I do plan on dying at my bench, but uh, not quite yet. And yes, I will try to get that on video. By the way, I must say I'm uh, very happy. This uh, channel is now uh, pretty much at 40,000 subscribers. I must admit it was a childhood dream ever since I was a small boy back in the 1970s to have my own YouTube channel with uh, thousands of subscribers. If you haven't yet subscribed and uh, you like what you see and hear, then uh, please do so. Help me get to 50,000. That would be very cool. All right, with the old loom removed from the hands, we're going to clean it a little bit more off camera. And then we're going to start uh, putting in uh, the new loom. When I say new loom, uh, obviously it is new, but uh, we don't want it to uh, look new. 
there are a few different ways of uh, making loom look old and uh, basically match the dial that is what we're trying to do what I'm gonna do uh, this time is to actually put in a little tiny drop of uh, colored uh, paint model paint and then we'll try to make that match uh, the old uh, burnt out uh, radium loom on the dial first when we're mixing the loom we want to make sure it's pretty runny if it's uh, too thick it's gonna sort of bulge up in the hands and then not look good so it has to be quite runny after mixing uh, the loom we're gonna let it sit for about 20 minutes and then it should have the right consistency if not we can put in some uh, thinner we're going to use this English uniform uh, color, which uh, should be a fairly good match to uh, the dial. And then we can mix that into the loom. This allows us to have the same consistency as a normal loom, but then uh, with uh, less uh, brightness and also then a better color, of course. This uh, big hour hand, uh, that uh, area is uh, not that easy to loom actually. It's much easier of course when you have a small little slit like on uh, the minute hand. But ultimately we managed to uh, cover both and then we're going to let them sit also for uh, about uh, 20 minutes. Now multitasking is actually not possible. We cannot do many things at one time, we can only do one thing at one time, but uh, given that we're uh, now waiting for our loom, we can start uh, working on uh, the other parts of the movement. First thing we're going to do is to uh, put in the shock settings. What we're doing here is to um, bathe the jewels and also uh, the escape wheel in uh, something called fixo drop. That leaves a very thin film on the surface of those parts and that uh, film uh, helps uh, the lubrication stay in place and not creep. We're also dipping the jewels, the pallets, in the pallet fork. And then just to make sure we're going to clean the pivots of the escape wheel and uh, the pallet fork so there's no residue left on uh, those. We put a tiny little drop of uh, thin oil into the center of uh, those uh, capstones, those uh, flat jewels, if you will. Steady. All right. And then we put this uh, other part of the shock setting on top. You can see that uh, these two shock settings are actually a little bit different. The right one is clearly a bit taller, but the jewel is a little bit uh, thicker. And that thicker one then goes into the top of the balance, and the balance cock as we see here. And the other one goes on the other side of the main plate. All right, let's see if the balance oscillates freely. Yeah, that looks nice. Then let's uh, go on with uh, the barrel and the mainspring. So I mentioned initially that uh, this 267 movement is uh, part of a legendary family. And that family is the Omega 30 family. Simply named Omega 30 because back in those days they just named the movements after uh, the diameter. So for the recent uh, Omega 33.3 video, I got exactly that question. Why is the movement named 33.3? Uh, so there you have it. The Omega 30 was uh, the mainstay of uh, Omega Hand 1 watches for about 40 years. It was introduced actually before the Second World War. And through different iterations, it went from being a 15 joule movement to a 17 joules with uh, the Inca block as well. They uh, made uh, center second uh, versions. This one is, of course, a sub seconds version. 
and uh, the 30T2 was then renamed the 260 back in the late uh, 1940s and this is the 267. And while I've been talking we managed to get uh, the mainspring into the barrel. You might remember that uh, there was a lot of play in the bearing in the barrel bridge. You can see that uh, here as well. So we're going to have to do something about that. So we're going to use a watchmaker sledgehammer. It has two ends. One is named destruction and the other doom. And then we're going to hammer the living daylight side of this bridge. We're going to hammer it with all our might and that will reduce the hole size. Well, it doesn't really sound very manly, does it? Hmm. So I did get a comment uh, last time I had a video with uh, this type of uh, hole adjustment and uh, the commenter said it sounded like a woodpecker and I think I'm never going to get that comment again. <laughs> anyway, after uh, reducing the hole size with a hammer, we are going to open it a little bit again with a smoothing brooch and then it should be just fitting so that uh, the barrel rotates uh, freely, but uh, it doesn't have a lot of play. So this family of movements really crushed it in uh, the observatory tests that were very popular uh, back in the day. And the reason for that, and of course also the reason why this movement was produced for so many years, is that it has a very simple but uh, very, very efficient uh, design. You might have noticed that the barrel is actually really big compared, of course, to the size of the movement itself. And the balance is also very, 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 very big. Relatively speaking, obviously, I mean, compared to a watchmaker's bicep is almost uh, nothing, of course. But uh, compared to most watches, uh, the balance is really big. It covers uh, pretty much the whole uh, radius of uh, the watch movement. And a bigger balance lends itself to more precise timekeeping. We're over on the dial side of the main plate again, and we're putting on the cannon pinion. It's named the cannon pinion because it uh, sort of resembles a cannon, but this one does not have a hole in it. If you uh, can guess why this kind of pinion does not have a hole in it, uh, let me know in the comments. But the cannon kind of pinion is a very important piece because, uh, as you saw, we press fit it onto the extended arbor of the center wheel. So the center wheel uh, sticks out through the main plate from uh, the train side. And then by linking those two sides with the cannon kind of pinion, we can then have the hands move together with the train. We use a little bit of Rodico to uh, hold the setting lever in place while we put in the setting lever screw. The reason for that is that the setting lever screw is uh, not held in place by the bridge. And we're going to put a little bit of uh, semi-thick oil on these uh, posts. The general uh, rule for uh, watch lubrication is that we uh, lubricate everywhere there is some sort of friction. This friction is either uh, two pieces rubbing together, like in uh, the keyless works uh, here, or in rotational friction, that uh, part rotates on the post or around another piece of uh, metal. All right, let's see if the keyless works uh, is functioning. And we can see that the copper plating on the movement uh, is a bit tarnished. And that's just because of uh, dirt not having been removed uh, in time, so it's been allowed to uh, degrade the plating. 
You can also see that uh, the train bridge is a slightly different uh, shade of uh, copper. Exactly why that is, I'm not sure. It can be a replaced part, of course, but uh, most likely it's just that it's been uh, rubbed or treated some uh, something more than the other ones. Another pretty common question I get is uh, which movements uh, are the easiest to uh, learn watch repair on? And the general answer is uh, twofold. A large movement and the movement that is running. So this kind of movement is actually very easy to work on. It's very simple. Uh, parts are large. The screws are mostly quite large. It's also not very difficult to find uh, replacement parts, although uh, they are starting to get more expensive as well. But if you want to start uh, fixing watches yourself, then uh, do start with a watch that is running. Otherwise it's going to be very difficult to figure out what you have to do to make it run when you're a novice. With a pallet fork in place, we're going to lubricate um, one of the pallets itself. This uh, red ruby we see here. This is the exit pallet. And what it does, it uh, allows the escape wheel on the left here with those uh, little bit strange looking teeth. It allows the escape wheel to uh, escape one half tooth at a time. And then the entry pallet on the other side of the fork does the other half tooth. All right, moment of truth. Let's see if we can get the balance uh, properly in and start uh, the watch. Yeah. All right, we'll give it a little bit uh, more of a wind. And we're gonna oil the remaining uh, jewel holes and then put it on a demagnetizer and a time grapher. And we see that uh, only by cleaning the movement we get a hundred degrees more uh, amplitude, which is uh, good. We have to adjust the timekeeping a little bit. And we do that by moving this uh, regulator pin. Gently moving that back and forth, we can adjust the timekeeping of the watch. So let's see the impact of that. I also adjusted uh, the lift angle on the right to 49 degrees. That's the correct number for this watch. And we're happy with that. So let's then uh, get uh, the hour wheel and the dial and the hands back on. Let me know if you think uh, the loom in the hands match uh, the dial okay. It's uh, difficult to get an exact same shade, but uh, they will also not be the exact same shade if they were completely original. But we want them to look at least uh, so close that you're not going to immediately think that, oh, that looks strange. So I hope that's mission accomplished. Also, the hour hand and the minute hand have the same uh, loom now, so that they don't look uh, different like uh, they did before. Then we're going to turn the hands around the dial just to make sure that uh, they are aligned and also that they do not touch each other, nor the dial, nor the second sand. All right, to the case, uh, we need to put in the new crystal. We're going to use our crystal press for that. We find the die that uh, fits the case, so that the case is uh, kind of self-centering. And then we find the top die that uh, fits uh, the crystal, so that it presses the crystal down and in a little bit. And that way it's going to fit nicely into the case.
There we go. Last thing we have to do then is to uh, put in a new gasket. This watch is uh, never going to be uh, waterproof. And uh, as I mentioned before as well, we are actually going to reuse the same crown for the time being. I am trying to find the original uh, crown, but that's quite difficult for a model that was only produced for two years, some uh, 65 years back. But I will uh, try to do that and we'll update uh, everyone afterwards. But in the meantime, I'm going to put in uh, the new gasket. And we're also going to adjust the length of the stem a little bit. I also wanted to tie back to the waterproofing discussion we had a little bit earlier on. This watch is designed to have a crown tube. As you might be able to see now and as you might have seen initially when uh, the movement actually moved a little bit inside the case when we uh, moved the crown is that there's a gap between the stem and the sides of the case in that uh, stem hole. So we do need to put in a tube and then that tube will fit into the rubber gasket in the, in the original crown. But for now we're just gonna clean up the threads of the stem a little bit and then we're going to shorten it a little bit and then we're going to try to find the, the proper crown. So which uh, sound do you prefer? Uh, this one or the ultrasonic? I really cannot decide. That's why I keep both of them on loop in my uh, earphones at night so I can uh, properly relax. All right, with the crown fitting a bit more snugly to the case, we're going to put on the case back again. And we're going to find a nice strap as well. Before seeing the watch on the wrist, I just want to remind everyone that at vintagewatchservices.eu, you will always find more than 100 beautiful vintage watches. And as a YouTube subscriber, you get 10% off. Just ask us for the coupon code. And there we have it. The Omega Ranchero. 1958. Omega's biggest flop, but still a pretty cool watch in my view. In its original condition as well, apart from the lumen hands. Hope you liked this video. If you did, then uh, please subscribe. That will really help uh, the channel. We'll be back with another video shortly. Until then, ta-ta.